you know Elvis died. Elvis wanted to go to Hollywood and make movies again. He said, I'm going to let go of, and he named all the guys that were going to be fired. Three, four people were mentioned that were going to stay with him. And his father knew about it. And we made plans for months. He said, Larry, I don't want to be on pills anymore. I know I messed up. I let it go too long. I know my health has gone down the drain. I haven't been exercising. I want to go on your diet. We'll go to Hawaii. To that, We went on a little trip for about a week to Hawaii. And Elvis leased a home, and it was great. And he laughed, and he felt good. He said, well, lease that house. And we're going to stay there until I get healthy again. And we're going to watch movies every day. And we're going to, get, we're going to come up with an idea for a movie and hire screenwriters to craft movies that are right for me. And I'm not going to sing in some of them. Later down the line, but I'm going to prove to the world that I'm an actor like a Brando or a Dean or these other guys, like Steve McQueen. And he really loved Clint Eastwood and Paul Newman. And he mentioned them. So now it's August the 16th. It was about 12, 12.30 at night. And we're leaving on tour that afternoon. And Elvis decided he wanted to go to the dentist. Okay. Elvis is strange things at strange hours. So he said to Joe Esposito and myself, you guys rent a movie when I come back. And we said, Elvis, what are you talking about? You won't go back to one o'clock. We can't go to the movies. We're going to Portland, Maine. He said, no, I, I want to see what, just one movie, just one movie. Okay, whatever Elvis wanted, Elvis Scott. He went to the dentist. Joe and I got on the phones. And it turned out the projectionist got sick with the flu. And Joe and I looked at each other, great. Can't go to the movies. We don't want to go. We don't want Elvis to go. He shouldn't have. So Elvis came back about an hour and a half later. He walked in. I can't even believe I'm telling you this. I'll tell you anyway. Because the truth is the truth. The truth is the truth. And I swore to God to Elvis Presley that I would tell the world the truth about his life. He asked me to. April 25th, 1977. And he said, man, Hollywood never got me. The media, they never got me. Some of my fans don't know the certain things. I want them to know that I'm a spiritual person because the world doesn't know I'm spiritual. They'll never get me. Spiritual, listen to his music. He was the most spiritual person I ever met. I've met a lot of people. Door opened and Elvis walked in. He has jumpsuit on, big belts one of his big belts, sunglasses. He took sunglasses off, and I'm standing about seven, eight feet away, and he looked at me, and he went like this. He put his glasses on, and he walked upstairs. My heart sank. So much was communicated to me at that moment. I was freaked out. I went in the other room and I sat down. And the next thing I knew, someone was shaking me. Larry, Larry, Elvis is on the phone. He wants you. I, he was upstairs. So I, he said, Larry. I said, Elvis. And when I heard his voice, it was so bizarre. Because he sounded really beautiful and young and 
buoyant. He said, well, Larry, what do you think? And he started laughing. And I started laughing. You know, when someone laughs, it, it becomes infectious almost. And you start laughing. I, I don't know, Elvis. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, you tell me. And we started laughing. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, he's all right. Because, you know, I felt so bad when he shook his head. He was communicating something to me. He says, well, I think is you should get your ass out of the chair and come upstairs. We have so much to talk about. I said, Elvis, you're right. And he sounded really young, like a 16-year-old kid. So it made me feel better. I said, Elvis, I, we do have a lot to talk about. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Did you bring those books? I said, Elvis, are you kidding? Did I bring you books? I said, yeah, I brought the books. He said, well, all right, well, come upstairs, let's talk. I said, no, Elvis, I'm going to go to my room. I'm going to get some sleep. You need to get some sleep. He said, I said, we're going on tour tomorrow. We'll be together every day. I have to take care of your hair tomorrow. I have to color it. He said, all right. Okay, Larry, if that's what you think. I said, I'll, I'll see you tomorrow, Elvis. When you wake up, believe me, I'll be there. He said, okay, okay. But Larry, Lawrence, he said, I want you to remember one thing. He was quoting from one of the books. Elvis had memorized passages that would blow your mind. He knew the book The Prophet by heart. He, when he made movies, he would read the script once, twice, three, he knew his lines. There were times when the, the co-star was in a scene with Elvis. She would drop her lines, and Elvis would whisper her line to her. He knew their lines. At any rate, Elvis said to me, Lawrence, don't forget. Angels fly because they take themselves so lightly. Angels fly because they take themselves so lightly. It's the last thing he ever said to me. Last time we ever spoke. I went to my room. And I remember I took my clothes off and I got in bed and I had a book. To read. And my phone rang. It was Al Strada, one of Elvis's aides. Larry, Elvis wants his books. <laughs> he wants those books you brought. All right. I'll, I figure I have to get dressed. I said, Al, I'm in bed. He said, all right, I'll come and I'll get them. So he came. It was very nice of him. Came with three books. Da -da -da. A couple hours later, Elvis's body was found on the floor with that book clutched to his chest. He was reading when he passed away. What went on at Graceland that afternoon, I'll never forget Lisa Marie. She was nine years old. She, I remember she put her hands on and she said, you know, I can't believe it. Elvis Presley is dead. I was stunned. What a much, wow. Vernon was a wreck. We thought he was going to have a heart attack because he had a bad heart. And he said, come here, Larry, come here, come here. He put his arms around me. And he was, and the funeral director came over, uh, Robert uh, Kendall, and he and, and, and Vernon came up to me and said, Larry, you got to go and take care of Elvis's hair. You know how he's supposed to look? He would want you to do this. You got to do it, Larry. I said, oh, of course I will. Of course I will. And he, Robert told me where to go the next morning at 8 o'clock. And Charlie Hodge said, Larry, you can't go by yourself. You can't do this by yourself. You can't. I'll go with you as moral support. I said, okay, Charlie. 
So eight o'clock in the morning, I went to the Memphis funeral home. Thousands of people outside the gate. They're all hanging. Nothing was being said by anyone. I just saw people crying. And all I heard was helicopters above me. It was so eerie. The, the media helicopters and a police helicopter. I'm led down this corridor, this brick corridor, and all I could hear is the sound of my heartbeat reverberating. Bum, 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 bum. And I look at the end, a room, I see a table. And I stopped in my track. I went like that. And this cop grabbed me by the arm. And I said, let me go, let me go. I'm all right, I'm all right. Because I knew what I had to do and I knew what I had to face. I walked into the room. There was a table with Elvis's body lying on it. Sheet up to here. I walked to this side of him. Charlie's on the other side, and I looked at that face. I looked at his nose, his eyes. I thought that will never, ever sing again. And I noticed a weak growth of gray hair everywhere. Thank God there was a female, mort a, a female mortician. And I said, do you have your mascara? And she did. Thank God it was black. And in those days, a little brush, the women know what I'm talking about, a little brush. <laughs> I spit in it. I, sh I blended and smeared it in his, no one ever knew I faked it. You know, you do what you have to do. How I got, I, I can't begin to tell you what happened to me for the next hour and a half, two hours, because I couldn't leave him and I stood with him. And memories started flooding. I thought my heart and soul was rupturing. I can't go further with this with you right now. The funeral, at the end of the funeral, and I'll wrap this up. The, 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 the ceremony's over. Elvis is in his casket. And Vernon Presley and myself Joe Esposito and Jerry Schilling, Sam Thompson, Dick Grobe, George Klein were standing there. The lid and, and Robert Kendall, the guy from the, uh, the home, he said, I'm sorry you guys, it's getting late, we have to close the casket. And Vernon screamed, this is it son, this is the final curtain. Joe Esposito, took off Elvis's TCB diamond ring, handed it to Vernon, put it in his pocket. The lid's coming down and no one will ever see Elvis Presley. And I said to myself, this is it. You have to, Larry. You have to do this. I'm sitting right next to Vernon. I put my hand in on his forehead and I closed my eyes and I said something silently to myself and to Elvis. I pulled my hand out, the lid closed, and I wanted and I wanted to be the last person to ever touch him. And I am. <laughs>